Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome out there, YouTube, to another one of these episodes that we're in talking about the God questions. And I'm going to do something a little different. I want to ask you my own question, not one of the God questions from the series, but I want to ask you a question right off the bat here as we get started today. And while you're sitting at home, you're watching this on YouTube, I'd like you to think about this. I'd like you to process this question, and we're going to come back to it later. We're doing it very intentionally. You ready? Like, here's the question that I'd like to start you with today. If you knew that today was your last day, what would you do with your time? Like, if, I want you to think about this. What would you do if you knew this was it? Jesus was coming tomorrow. You got 24 hours on this planet. Where would you spend your time? What would you do with it? We're going to come back to that in a little, in a little bit here. But I want you thinking about that as we get started here today. You know, over the last couple of weeks, we've shifted this God Questions series into four questions about the church. And, and while I'm supposed to be continuing that today, I got to tell you, I'm stuck on something. And I'm stuck on this because of just interactions with people in both our communities here at MRC, inside the spiritual family. I'm stuck on this and I want to come back to it. And it's something that really came out the last time I was here talking to you guys. And and I think it's something that's a really big deal. So I want to remind you about what we were talking about. The last time I spoke with you, we were talking about the importance of how we view the church. And because how we view the church is really how we're going to treat the church. And we focused on the, the concept that we should treat the church as our spiritual family. Do you remember that? Like we talk that way often here at MRC. We use that language all the time. And that allowed us to talk about some things that are very important that should be seen and felt and heard inside a healthy family. We talked about love and generosity and support that should be seen inside a healthy family. We spoke of the patience and willingness that we should have to stick with things over time with our families, even when things aren't going the way they want, even in divisive and challenging times, families stick together. And then we talked about the importance of adults inside a family, that we are continuing to grow to maturity inside our families. We joked about what a family would look like if it was being run by children or teenagers instead of adults. I mean, oh my word, like think of the smells and what all would go on in a home if it was run by teenagers. And while that was kind of funny to look at how a family would look or not function well as a teenager would run it, when it comes to the spiritual family, when we don't see people growing to spiritual maturity inside the spiritual family, well, that's not funny at all. It's actually tragic. You know, because a church with the spiritually mature, without the spiritually mature in it, it can't do the very thing that the church is called to do. And the church is called to love and love well. We can't love those inside the church well without spiritual maturity. And can I tell you something? We can't love those outside the church looking in well either without spiritual maturity. And we have to understand how essential spiritual maturity really is and how it's measured. You see, spiritual maturity is measured in how well we love others. It is not measured by how long you've been a Christian. It has nothing to do with your tenure inside a church. It's not measured by what you do inside a church. It's, it's not measured by the knowledge you've accrued about God and spiritual things. Your spiritual maturity is measured in how well you love others. And I really want you to hear me now. When we accept Jesus and we become Christians, growing into, into spiritual maturity, that's not just given to you. That doesn't just fall in our laps. That's something that we must intentionally pursue in our lives. It's not a natural thing. It's not an easy thing to do. And many Christians never do grow in their faith, in their spirituality, because it requires intentionality and effort. It doesn't just happen. It's not something you gain because you've been a Christian for a long time or because you do things inside a church setting. It's all about the intentional work the personal work that you're putting in with Jesus Christ. A spiritually mature Christian loves well. And the problem is, 
that few of us have learned or worked on how to do that. See, this is one of the greatest gifts that we can give the world, to love others well. And it starts individually and it affects the entire spiritual family and those around us who need God's love too. This takes the power of God in us. This takes a commitment to learn and grow and break free from the things in our lives that keep us stuck. And I got to tell you, this is something we got to talk about. And I just can't get off this thought process here lately. One of the hardest things for me to watch and accept or to be around when it comes to church and church life has always been watching how Christians behave and treat each other. It's often so messy and that confuses me and hurts me. But even worse than that is how Christians treat people around them who are on the outside of the church looking in. You know, people who don't yet know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, who desperately need Jesus as much as we all do in our lives. That has always been the hardest thing for me. How those inside the spiritual family treat those outside the spiritual family. You know, I got to tell you, I'm coming to some different conclusions when it comes to all this stuff because I used to, I'll be honest with you, I used to just think the worst of people. You know, like I I would look at someone who was hard-hearted and not loving well to someone outside of, of the church and I would just think the worst of that religious person. But I've come to realize something. Not everybody around me is a horrible person if they're not loving well. They aren't just prideful and selfish and mean or hard-hearted. They're probably just stuck. They're not growing. They're not moving towards spiritual maturity. And that's a process that we are all on, myself included. You see, the issue, for the most part, I want to say it, for the most part, isn't whether a Christian loves God. They do. They love God. The issue, for the most part, isn't whether a Christian wants other people to come to know Jesus and have heaven to look forward to in their lives too someday. They do. The issue is that for so many Christians, there's just no growth to spiritual maturity. So we struggle to do the hard thing. And the hard thing is love. We struggle to grow and heal from our hurts and wounds and experiences and because of that lack of growth we struggle to grow beyond our self-centered instincts as people which means we're going to struggle to love others well we can say one thing and do the other at some times this is why we look so hypocritical right because we're we're not growing to spiritual maturity we can struggle to see and feel compassion for those around us we don't see their stories or give them the benefit of the doubt. We struggle with our words, and they can hurt people because our words are revealing the messiness of our own heart conditions. And I gotta tell you, as I, I used to just assume the worst in people, and I've realized something. This isn't because all Christians are religious and hard-hearted. It's simply a lack of growth to spiritual maturity. Now, that happens for a lot of different reasons. And, you know, some people just decide that accepting Jesus into their lives is enough. Like, they've accepted Jesus, they're good now, they got the fire insurance, they're going to heaven someday, or or they think maybe that's enough and they've arrived in some way, but we misunderstand or we just don't care to keep going. We don't see that it's the start of our journey into spiritual maturity and we just don't grow to be more and more like Jesus each day. And we need to. The problem is that takes work. That takes intentionality. That takes focus. That takes passion to seek God. Otherwise, we stay stuck developmentally in our own hurts. And what do we know about hurt people? We know that hurt people, they hurt people. They can love God and they can want others to experience that love, but The hurts and wounds of the heart come out of their mouths, come out of their choices, come out in their behaviors and their actions, and it leads to a lot of hurt people here on this earth. You see, with no growth spiritually, we never move past our selfishness and learn the value of serving and loving those around us. Just like an adolescent 
or a teen, we stay focused on ourselves and we use the church rather than caring for it. And worse, a community of self-focused people turn inward and are unable and unwilling to share God's love with this world. With no continued growth to spiritual maturity, we can walk through life unaware or just numb to the needs and the hurts and the hearts all around us. The reality is the church needs its family members to be growing to spiritual maturity because the spiritually mature, they love well. They see people. They see the hearts and the stories of people all around them. They give people the benefit of the doubt in a tough moment. They have compassion and an ability to place themselves in someone else's shoes. And they want others to experience their best life too. Without this ability to love well, the church and its members will do a lot of damage to people in desperate need of God's love. And we live in times today when people need God's love more than ever before. And how are those people supposed to experience God's love on this planet? They should be experiencing it through Christians. But so often they experience the opposite. And you know what that does? That drives them further away from God rather than attracting them to him. You know, I was stuck in that thought over the last couple of weeks sharing in both Dillsburg and Heidlersburg on the subject of spiritual maturity. And I woke up last Monday morning and I was still stuck in that concept of loving well inside and outside of the spiritual family. And I opened up my laptop and and the first thing I saw was an article that just crushed me. Now, I haven't read this yet without crying, so I'm going to try to do that on YouTube Um, without crying, but I wanted to share this with you. It's an article from Philip Yancey, and he's talking to a friend um, who is an AA member, an alcoholic, who is talking about the church. And I want you to see this. I have it on the screens because I want you to be able to read it along with me. An alcoholic friend of Philip Yancey once said to him, when I'm late to church, people turn around and stare at me with frowns of disapproval. I get the clear message that I'm not as responsible as they are. When I'm late to an AA meeting, the meeting comes to a halt and everyone jumps up to hug and welcome me. They realize that my lateness may be a sign that I almost didn't make it. When I show up, it proves that my desperate need for them won over my desperate need for alcohol. You know, we got to talk. How do we do with loving others? How well do you love others? How do you view people? How do you treat people? Is there compassion? Do you see their hearts and their stories unfolding before you? Can you place yourself in their shoes? Can you extend the same love and grace to people that you need to? Now let me ask you this, who do you spend your time with? Who would you hang out with? Who do you hang out with? Who are you willing to hang out with? Who's worth your time and your energy? Are there certain people today that you just want no part of? Are there certain people that it's easier to love and tolerate and care for? Now I need you thinking with me. Who did Jesus hang out with? And how did he treat them? You know, Jesus hung out with the sinners and the people who were on the outside of life looking in. The worst of the worst of the worst. He hung out with the worst people of those times. Those that the religious people of that time wanted no part of and were not open to loving well. Now let me ask you something else. Does that mean that Jesus agreed with all their actions? Does that mean that Jesus was approving of all their sin or helping them to sin more by spending time with them? No. But what did Jesus do? He loved those people where they were. Let's read one story on this, Matthew 9, verses 10 through 13. A lot here, a lot here to look at. 
Later, Matthew, a tax collector, right, invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. All right. So this is interesting, right? Because there were people in Jesus' time that he loved on and showed a lot of grace and love to, even if they weren't living the way that he wanted them to be living or would have liked them to be living. But there were also people in Jesus' time that he did push in on, on how they lived their lives. And we see that even in these couple of verses in Matthew here, don't we? This is something that I think so many of us Christians are getting backwards right now in our culture and in our world today. I want you to think with me here, who did Jesus confront on how they lived their lives? It was those who knew God. It was the religious of that time. It was the teachers of the law. It was those who would have been considered very godly people of that time. Do you see it? This is so important, and it's something that Christians are getting backwards today often. Who is he confronting, and who is he building bridges of love to? You know, this, I, I got to keep going. You know, there are a lot of terms today. <laughs> There are a lot of terms today, and many Christians, you know, we scoff at a lot of terms that we're hearing in our culture today. And I got to tell you, there's times when I hear them and I cringe too. There's a lot of them, right? T terms we didn't know growing up. I didn't hear them in the 80s and the 90s growing up. But there's things we hear today. Terms like triggered. We know that one, right? We hear this often. How about this one? This comes up a lot in church today, especially with those who don't um, really aren't into this faith stuff too much or look on the outside of church looking in. Do you ever hear this one? Safe space, right? Have you heard that? Does that make you cringe a little bit when you're here we go? What, what's Sam doing? Who's he voting for in the fall? You know, like, well, let's talk about it. How do we make a safe place for others? What is our sign that this is a safe place, that the house of the Lord is a safe place for them? Well, you know what it is? It's our love. It's how we share and interact with people. It's the love of God pouring into us in such a way that it can't help but overflow out onto others. If we love well, we don't need signs on the door to let people know that this is a safe space. They're just going to know it. This is why we must be continually growing to spiritually maturity. We need to love well. If we're not spiritually mature, we just won't love well. And if we don't do that, you know what we can't do? Share Jesus with the world. We'll be completely blocked from doing that with others. So what are you doing in your own life to grow into spiritual maturity? If you're not active and intentionally spending time with God, if you're not engaging the scriptures and God's word, if you're not praying and inviting God into each day of your life, into the deepest parts of who you are, so that you can grow and be more and more like Christ each day, you might be wondering right now, like, why does this spirituality stuff not work? They advertise really well, this great life that we could all have, but I'm not experiencing it. You might be wondering why you keep hearing about this love that's not seen in your life. Why you hear about this life that you aren't finding in your life. You may be wondering where the spiritual growth is or life change from your faith is or when it will arrive. And I want you to hear me and I want to say this as lovingly as I can. If you aren't intentionally engaging and pursuing God, none of the other stuff's coming for you. And it won't get you to this place where you can love well. You know what that's like? That's like paying for a gym membership, never going to the gym to exercise, and then being upset with the gym because your physical body isn't getting to the place you'd like it to be. You got to ask yourself these questions. What are you doing to grow into spiritual maturity? This is so important because a spiritually mature person loves well and the world needs us to love well as Christians. You know, sharing God with this world is going to start with our ability to love well. It's that love that 
earns us the right and the opportunity that opens up doors for us into people's lives. But let's be real. We've all met people. I know people, you know people, and they're not all that easy to love at times, are they? I got to tell you, this is a challenge. On top of that, what does Jesus do with love? He doesn't leave it down here where it might be somewhat easy. He raises the bar on love constantly. He makes something that's already challenging even more challenging than it is. He doesn't just tell you to love the people that are easy to love. He doesn't tell you to just love people who agree with you. He doesn't tell you to just love people who believe what you believe. He doesn't tell, peop- tell you to love, just love the people that live the lives that you'd like them to be living and how they're living it. Jesus says that we are to love everyone, even those that aren't that easy to love. And I want you to take note when we read this scripture, because once again, as we start talking about this love that's beyond our own capability, our capabilities as people, it's beyond our instincts as people, you're going to see another challenge to grow up. Matthew 5, 46 through 48, this is message version, I love this. Jesus says, If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is grow up. Your kingdom subjects now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards you. We are to grow up and live out our God-created identity. We are to live generously and graciously towards others just the way God does to us. And again, others, they're not just people inside our circle of trust who think like we think, believe like we believe, act like we want them to act and agree with everything we say. It includes all those that aren't all that easy to love. You see, that only happens through God transforming us. And as we grow up into the people God calls us to be, because the spiritually mature, they love others well. All right. So at the beginning of this talk, I, if you haven't clicked out already, I, I asked you a question, right? And that question was important to me, and I asked it very intentionally. I asked you what you would do with your time if you knew you had one day left and Jesus was coming tomorrow. If you had 24 hours left to live, what would you do with that time? How would you spend it? Now, I asked that question very, very intentionally because in the last few weeks, there were a lot of Christians who thought the world was coming to an end and, and or that we were entering the end times. And, and it was all being signified in their minds through the solar eclipse that that was a big sign of all that was happening or beginning to happen. I got emails on this. I was sent articles on this. I saw social media posts on this. I got to talk about this with concerned Christians. And and I got to tell you, I heard fear from this. I saw a good bit of talk about this being a sign from the end times. But through that entire stretch, you know what really struck me? It is how many of those same people who literally thought that was their last day were spending that last few moments they had on this earth in their passion or their emotion or their fear or just the thought that this was it and that Jesus was returning. And by the way, it could be, you know, I I don't know, you know. But what did they do? How did they spend their time? Did they spread fear? Did they share Christ with others? Did they isolate? Did they choose to fight with people they didn't agree with? Did they push in on people who they believe are wrong, make sure that they knew who was right? Did they point out the sins of others to people? Did they try to help someone come to know Jesus? Yeah, I can't stop thinking about this. What did they do with their time? And what would you do if you knew it was your last day? You know, we might have done that in the past, right? Like just an exercise, maybe in school or something somewhere along the line where you thought about like, if today was my last day and I knew it was it, what would I do with the time? And you might think about different things. For some, they might think about their bucket list and all the things they've never experienced that they want to experience. You know, maybe you just go out and run up credit card debt and just buy everything you always wanted that you never could have afforded before because you know you're not going to have to pay it off. But like, We might think of people that we love and that we'd want to spend time with or maybe some things we never said to somebody that we want to say before we leave this earth, but what would it be for you? Because I got to tell you, 
For many Christians who sincerely believed that that day was it, the concept of loving others well was not in the forefront of their minds. And as Christians who are to be growing to be more and more like Jesus each day, we get the Bible to read and study how Jesus lived his life. That's pretty awesome, right? Not only are we to pursue living like him, we get to see how he did it. And we get this gift in Jesus' life of seeing how he chose to live his last day, knowing it was his last day before he went to the cross. And what did he do with his time? And I'll just tell you on the front end. He loved and humbly served. He chose to wash the feet of the people he cared about. And he did it symbolically, intentionally, showing us how we are to live, telling us we'd be blessed to do what he did. He humbly served people around him, even those that were going to treat him poorly or had been for some time. And I want to tell you, this is something we need to see. John 13, we're going to read verses 1 through 5 here as we end talk for a little bit. Before the Passover celebration, listen, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of the Simon Iscariot, to, Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them, with the towel he had around him. I want you to see this here. Jesus knew that his time was up. He knew what was about to take place. He knew it was his last day. He knew Judas was about to betray him for a bag of money. He knew Peter was about to go and deny his name three times. He knew this was it. And he chose to spend his final moments humbly, lovingly washing the feet of his disciples his disciples who doubted, his disciples who never heard him or seemed to understand anything he was trying to tell him, tell them, his disciples who literally were going to betray him, his disciples who were bickering over who should have the best seats and rankings amongst them, his disciples who were worried about other people out there doing good work in God's name, his disciples who spoke out of turn and just seemed to never get what he was up to. Jesus chose to spend his final moments loving those who weren't perfect and modeling for us the true role of our lives as Christians. John 13, 12 to 17, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus spent his last moments washing their feet, then explains how intentional it was that he did it. And he says, I did this, now you go do this. I've set the example for you, my followers, to follow and live out. So let's talk here. There were so many people who thought the solar eclipse was it, or the beginning of it. And, and what did they do with that time? You know, I would argue it would have looked very different if they would have followed Jesus' example of what he did with his time. You know, I just want to talk with you a moment and, and maybe let you look behind the scenes at MRC for a second here. Because as we were getting all those concerns from Christians over the end times, we're also seeing more and more people in really difficult spots in their lives. Devastated and broken, hurting and hopeless, and in desperate need of love and a safe place. And Ken and I have sat with people in desperate need of help. People with, in so much pain that the thought of ending their life seemed like the best option they had in life. We've sat with people who are hurting and have been hurt by people, Christian people, and it's crushing them. And now, they don't feel that Christians 
or the church is a safe place for them because of their painful moments that they've experienced. We sat with people who know how Christians will view them. They know the rules and they can predict how a Christian will respond to them and won't agree with them and how they're choosing to live. And they stand in that hurt and rejection and insecurity on how they're treated. Now here's what's interesting. They need help and they feel drawn to God enough to talk to a pastor about it. But they've felt rejection, judgment, and like they don't measure up. They feel unloved and unlovable. But you know what? We read earlier that that's who Jesus said we should be loving. The unlovable, right? Anybody can love the lovable, right? Any run-of-the-mill sinner can do that. Our job is to love the unlovable. We're seeing more and more people in crisis, hurting worse than ever before, confused, devastated, and in desperate need of God's love in their lives, in desperate need of the good news that we have to bring to them. And as that intensifies daily, I'm also receiving calls concerning emails, screenshots of end time predictions and how we're in the end times. And all I can think is, well, maybe it is, but I hope not because we have a lot of work to do yet. See, if this is it, well, then let's use our time as wisely as we can. Let's use it to help others the way Jesus told us that we should when he knew his time was up. It is heartbreaking for me, for us, to watch people struggle in this fallen and broken world, a world that needs Christians to be building bridges of love for people to cross over and experience God more than ever before, with people who are struggling and broken and more confused than they've ever been. So the question has to be, are we doing that? In Jesus' last moments, he showed up He showed us how to act and told us we would be blessed if we do what he did. And he loved imperfect, sinful people who didn't necessarily treat him the best. And he humbly washed their feet. So how are you doing with this? Are you humbly loving those around you who desperately need that love? Are there certain people that you're more open to helping and loving and humbly serving than others? See, we need to think this all through. Do you believe our spiritual family is a safe place for people who feel left out and on the outside looking in? Do you know that there are people around us who don't believe we are? So how do we break that mindset? What do we do about that culturally? How do we break through that mindset? Well, we earn it. And we earn it from them with the way we live our lives and how we treat them over time. We love others well. You know, back in the day, we used to use that, this term a lot, the WWJD stuff. You might have had the t-shirts and the bracelets. We thought it was cool there for a while to wear that stuff, and, and we believe that, right? What would Jesus do? A wonderful motto. We kind of wore it out over time and don't use it anymore, but we believe it to be true, and we would say that we should live this way as Christians, right? What would Jesus do? Think about it, then go do that. Well, we know it's our job to live our lives growing to be more and more like Christ each day. But if we're true, but are we truly living our lives like Him? Are we WWJDing? If we have no love and grace and patience and forgiveness, are we WWJD? Sorry, WWJDing? If we judge, if we focus on rankings and who's important and who's not, if we're pointing out someone else's issues and shortcomings of their sins? Are we WWJDing? Are we WWJDing if we go into what every everything and what we believe would be our last day and we don't do what Jesus told us to do and modeled for us to do? See, he he humbly served and loved in those moments and he told us we'd be blessed to do likewise. Yet so many Christians didn't do that. They continued to love those who are like them. They continued to love those who are easy to love, who agree with them, who they agree with how they're living, but that wasn't what Jesus challenged us to do. So I want you thinking about that. How do we Christians treat the hurting and marginalized people of this world? Then I want you to take it a step further and think, who did Jesus hang out with and love? Where did he spend his time? 
Who did he extend love and grace to? It was the marginalized and hurting people. It was the outcast and the lowly, quote unquote, lowly people of his time. He would sit and talk with people that you dare not sit and talk with. He, he just loved on those who needed it. So the big question is, would you? Now, Jesus did confront some people about how they lived. And who was that? It wasn't the marginalized. It wasn't those struggling. It wasn't those far from God. It was the religious leaders of that time. The prideful, the important of that time, who knew the law and ignored their desperate need of Jesus in their lives. Yet he was a loving friend to the outsider, to those the religious would look down upon and judge as sinners who they would never associate with. So can I ask you, would someone struggling in this world find you to be a safe place? Would they find your church community to be a safe space? And I want you to think this way. If Jesus was walking around on this earth today, right here in the year 2024, where and with whom would he be spending his time? Just think about that. Who would he be hanging out with, talking with, eating with, and loving on? And who would he be confronting today? And the follow-up is, is really important. If we are the extension of Jesus on this earth today, if we are the body of Christ here on this earth today, then shouldn't we be where he would be? And shouldn't we be confronting who he would be confronting? Yet so often, I think if we stopped and really slowed down and humbled ourselves and stopped worrying about who was right and who was wrong, I think we would admit we probably get this backwards more than we get it right. Which is why we have to pour into a relationship with Jesus to grow in spiritual maturity and love others well. These are challenging times that we live in and things are pushing against us today that we may, and I got to tell you, in all the struggles and all the challenges, it is hard and we can struggle and maybe not even know how to respond to some of the stuff people throw at us. End time stuff, safe spaces, trigger words, hurting people, confused and frustrated people, hate speech, cancel culture, new politics to fight over every day, and on and on I could go. But I want you to hear me. You don't have to have all the answers. And you don't have to have a great response and zinger to come back at somebody with to push back on this world. You, and you don't have to be right and prove how right you are all the time. You know what you need to do? You know what you're called to do? You know what you should do? Just love people where they are and watch what happens. It's the best advice I can give you today. You're not going to get it all right all the time, but if we're going to err in anything, let's err in loving well. Let's love the way Christians are, are supposed to love. Let's love the way we're called to love. Love even when it's not easy as Jesus told us to do. Just love. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Paul says, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. In the NLT it says, love never fails. See, if we love the way Paul describes our relationships, our, our churches, and the people we come in contact with will be impacted. If we want the kind of church that is truly making a difference in this world, that is effective in helping others find God, we have to love this way, the way Paul is describing here. When we do, people see it, they feel it, and they are drawn to it. They will know that we have something that they need. Love is the thing that attracts and opens up conversation and doors to share Christ. While trying to win arguments and prove how right we are and how wrong or sinful someone else is, well, that repels and pushes people further away from God. You see, this kind of love is different because it's so pure and perfect that it's undeniably coming from God. 
It's beyond our human instincts and ability to live and love the way Paul describes. That only happens and will take place in our lives when we're making the choice to grow in a relationship with God into spiritual maturity. A person walking with God, growing this way, is learning to do the hard thing, and that is to love others well. Now, that doesn't mean that we just have to smile constantly and be perfect. Like that's, <laughs> that's just not going to work. You don't have to pretend you're something you're not. You don't have to be perfect all the time. You're not going to be your person. You're going to mess up from time to time, which is why we're so glad that love is patient and kind, that it forgives and keeps no record of wrongs because we have emotions and stuff and we're going to have conflicts to handle from time to time. But when a church is filled with the spiritually mature, it's okay because we love well, we forgive, we work through things. You know, there are a lot of challenges that face, that we face as Christians in this world, a world that really wants us to bend to its desires rather than standing in God's desires for our lives, which is why we're so thankful that love never gives up, because without God's God's love in us, we just might give up this fight. This world of endless debates over right and wrong, over what truth is and what it's not, where people will come at us for answers to questions that we might not have all the answers for on how they're living or what they're doing and what the good news is. We, We don't have to have all the answers because our job is to love well. And when we find ourselves in a spot, in a tension point with somebody, and we're trying to figure out, my advice to you is lean in on this idea. Love never fails. That means if you're not sure how to respond to a challenging social issue or a theological question, err on the side of love and grace, because love never fails. It's not prideful, it doesn't fly off the handle. Love never fails. You know, I wanted to end with a little story here. And I got to tell you, I was introduced to a brand new term in the last couple of weeks. And I was thankful. It was a new one for me, but I was interested in hearing more about it. And that term is clobber verses. Now, that was a new one for me. And when the person brought that up, I, I, wanted, I asked a lot more questions because that intrigued me. What are clobber verses in Scripture? Well, clobber verses is a term that is being used today for verses in scripture that tell you if your lifestyle is wrong or that you're sinful. This is interesting, and in a way, it's it's a good descriptor, right? (laughs) Because there are some ouchy verses in scripture for all of us that we need to be challenged with and we need to deal with in our lives. You know, those you hear the Christian say, amen, ouch, those types of moments. There are some scriptures like that out there. So it's actually a pretty good descriptor of some scriptures. But I realized something as I was processing that. So many people on the outside of our faith looking in, they know the clobber verses. They focus on the clobber verses. They can quote the clobber verses. They have them in the holster and they're just ready for the next debate with another Christian. And I just kept thinking, wow, like what if the focus was on Jesus, who he is, how he lived, And what he did for each and every person on this planet, rather than in those raging debates over the clobber verses. Imagine a world full of Christians who lived and loved as Jesus did. Who would they they engage? Who would they spend their time with? Who would they simply love? And how would that disarm these debates over the clobber verses in Scripture. Who would they press in on? Who would they be in confrontation with over how they're choosing to live their lives? Imagine a world full of people who lived the way Paul described, with a love that never fails. You know, in a world that some Christians believe it's in its last days, we got to ask ourselves a question. If that's true, and we're loving well, what would a loving person do with that time? In a world full of broken, hurting, maybe angry people, people full of despair, who need God as intensely as they might be pushing Him away right now, what are we doing? 
Do we press in with judgment and tell them how right we are and how wrong they are? Do we dive into the debates so many of them are waiting on and expecting and hoping for? Well, I tell you what we're called to do. We're to love them as Jesus did and as he modeled for us to do. We pour into our relationship with God, which allows us to grow into spiritual maturity so that we can love others well. So often, I think we slide into these traps of arguments and debates and trying to prove who's right and who's wrong, which it just does the opposite of what we're trying to see and do in people's lives. We need to love the hurting people of this world right where they are, just as Jesus did. He ate with them. He loved people there, people who the religious of his time would dare not associate with, who he enraged the religious people of that time by hanging out with. Does that mean that Jesus approved of their sin? Does it mean he was agreeing with their lifestyle and pushing them to sin more because he was hanging out with them? No. He understood something. He knew they needed love. He knew they needed this love that was so pure and compassionate that would draw them to God. That love pulls people to God. It disarms the arguments, it disarms the emotion, and it does the exact thing we'd love to see in people's lives. It draws them to our Heavenly Father rather than pushing them further away. And our job is to do the same thing. Our job is to love well. And we can't do that if we're not pursuing a relationship with God, growing to be more and more like Him each day. The world needs the spiritually mature because the spiritually mature love well. We love you so much and we'll see you again next week.